Beloved, this series, um, Dead or Alive, will be based on, actually through our epistle lesson, the second lesson, which is James chapter 2, but I want to focus on verse 17. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And so we want to examine whether or not our faith is dead or alive. And in order to do that, we will use the gospel lessons for this month. And I will tell you, because I desire for us to go to work, it's Labor Day, you have a few days off extra, we're going to do some work. So actually, our reading will be taken from Mark chapter 7. Don't look at the screen just yet. Don't get ahead of yourself. Mark chapter 7, beginning at verse 24. When you're ready to go to work, say amen, and we'll go to work. Amen. All right. We are working. I'm loving it. And from there, he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know. Yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May his love and the comfort of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. All right, thank you, Bill. I'm glad somebody's awake. So this, this text comes to us with a whole lot of tension. I cannot tell you the number of people that have come to me distraught. Did Jesus just call this woman a dog? Are you kidding me? And so by way of Concordia Theological Seminary, there was a little gamuclecyk on a Friday afternoon, and someone even said, did Jesus say what I think he said to this woman? Okay, you'll figure that out when you get home. I said, I can't put that on Jesus. I don't know. But we will examine the text. And so I want you to mark that word, Syrophoenician. Like, what in the world? Where? Huh? Yeah? Does that really exist? And so we have Matthew's gospel here to kind of help us and, and, and make this a little plainer for our souls. In Matthew chapter 15, 21 through 22, I kind of tried to make work a little easier for you. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, do we see this word? Canaanite. A Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed. Well, now hopefully your souls are coming together because we can look at Syrophoenicia a little differently. So we have here, I'm trying to see if my portal will work, if you can see it. So you have Tyre, Sidon, the Phoenicians, and then it says for us, the Canaanites. So we're in this region, right? So Jesus is in here, they're having this encounter, but you're still probably saying, spiritually, so what? What does this mean? Why are you telling me this? All I know is, can't really figure out where Tyre and Sidon is, or Syrophoenicia, and my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, has just called this woman a dog. So I can't really go on because I'm stuck, right? We still tracking? Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 16 through 18. But the cities of these people that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance, you shall save alive nothing that breathes. You shall save alive nothing that breathes. What is God telling them? Kill everything. Kill everything. But you shall devote them to complete destruction. The Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded you. That they may not teach you to do according to all their abominable practices that they have done for their gods, and so you sin against the Lord your God. 
So here, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is standing in front of disobedience, standing in front of sin. He has told his children to kill the Canaanites. And so there is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, standing in one of the reasons he has to die, because of our disobedience. They did not do it. And so here he is, a few chapters before his death, coming face to face with our sin, with our disobedience. Now, you struggle with Deuteronomy chapter 20 as well, right? Because God is telling us to kill something. And that doesn't sound like the happy, clappy Jesus that I made. Jesus loves me. I don't want to kill anybody. Oh, can't we all kumbaya? Right? That's how we understand Jesus. And so our souls are destroyed. But God is not telling you anything cruel. But what he is doing is preventing you from some greater evil that will come along later if we are not obedient to his word. But here's the thing. That's too hard for me, God. So let's spiritualize this for a moment. There is someone in this room that God is telling you to kill some things, but your way is more important. And so I have to ask you this morning, is your disobedience to God more important than your way? If you examine Exodus, if you examine Joshua, it reminds us over and over that if you are not obedient, even to those difficult things that God has commanded you to do. So see, see, we're in covenant relationship with God. You got one or two choices. Get on board or get rolled over. That's uncomfortable for us, right? But when we don't, we hear in Exodus, we hear in Joshua, that those things that you do not kill, that God has called you to kill, will become a snare to you. Anybody know what a snare is? I'm not talking about a drum. Somebody's with me, thank you. It's a, it's a trap usually made from a string or a wire. Yeah, it's a trap. Let's make it a little more plain there, Brother Bill. It's a noose. It will hang and kill you. And so we're in covenant relationship with God, and he's promised to be our God. If you promise to faithfully be his people, don't trip on what he's asking you to do. Submit and do what God has called you to do. We still tracking? So we're back at this text, and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is in face-to-face -face encounter with this mother who is desperate for her child to be healed. This woman has absolutely no business. We, we just laid this out, right? No business to be in front of Jesus. This is straight disrespect. It comes no more blatant. We just read, God said, kill the Canaanites, and lo and behold, who is in front of Jesus? A Canaanite woman. And so now we've got some tension. But I want to take you back. I want to take you back. We're back in the text, right? So we're in verse 26. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the little children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And so now your soul is aggravated again, and he really just caught her a dog. Let's set the scene for a second. Okay, here we go. So I want to show you, we have a temple divide here. And if you could see this a little clearer, here is where the children of Israel participate in the temple. Okay? Here is where the women of the children of Israel get to participate in the temple. Guess what this is right here? Where the Gentiles get to participate in the temple. Don't come any closer. You stay outside. You can get close, but you, you don't come in here and worship with us Emmanuel Lutheran people. You stay, I'm sorry, you stay out there and do your own thing because we have a secret handshake with God in the temple. And so this woman realizes that throughout history, there has been a divide between the Jews and the Gentiles. And so when God calls her a dog, she doesn't get as offended as you do. Because she had a 
context in which this was taking place throughout history again check out first and second kings first and second samuel you will hear uh, am i the dog of judah am i th this this conversation erupts throughout history and so this woman has this context now as we explore this let's just make it plain yes jesus offends her yes he calls her a dog But I ask you, if you were in a situation and you had asked somebody clearly to do something, and as a result, you said, if you do this for me, I'm going to do X, right? And lo and behold, after you've upheld your end of the bargain, you discover that they have it. Now, I mind you, we're in church. What would you say? Right? What would your response be to that particular individual, to those people? And, and, and so we get it. She gets that. But I want you to begin to hone in on to something else. Jesus also says to her that I must serve the Jewish people first. So in this one statement, he says, the children at the table. Did you read it with me? Right? The children at the table have to eat first. So Jesus, our Lord and Savior, is continuing this divide. But what he knows is that a few chapters from now, he will go to the cross and die to include everybody. And this divide will be taken away. But he's following this to prove a point. I hope somebody's there already. I want you to watch her response. Because we're talking about faith that is alive. Let's see if my slides will work. Uh, yeah, we got that one. Faith that is alive, well, while it's catching up to us, faith that is alive requires discernment. That is the ability to see and understand what is going on beyond what is presented on the surface. Let me pause, time out, I know you're tracking. There will be a slide that comes up where there is a misspelled word. I couldn't change it or save it to save my life. I tried six times, and I try not to share with Sugar the sermon before she hears it, um, so she didn't get to proofread it, so it's coming up, just letting you know. So do you have the ability to see and understand spiritually what's going on beyond what is said? Here's the mother's response. Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's bread. So see, she didn't just trip on the fact that Jesus called me a dog. Her faith, what she heard about Jesus. She heard about people being healed. She heard about, I was going to share with you something else, but she heard about the world's largest fish fry, and, and, and she was all good with this. She was like, you know what? If anybody can change my situation, this Jesus can. And so she went beyond being called a dog. Faith that is alive. Now, I'm trying to share with you a little Greek. Canarion is the Greek word for a family pet, not a wild or street dog. Now, while this is still disrespectful, even if I am a pet, see, see during Jesus' day, there were some clear dis divisions, not like many of us today. Your pets were not your children or your grand dog or grand cat. I, I know I'm offending some folks, but there was some clear division here. Have your cats, have your pets. I, I got it. I understand. Play with them. But kids, they are not. I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just looking at this. While this was disrespectful, her faith allowed her to recognize that she had two choices. Walk away rejected or embrace what she knew about Jesus as a healer. How many of us feel dogged by God and stick our tail between our legs and just go on and start crying somewhere in the corner? Yeah. And then our faith is just all shallow and God is mistreating me and I didn't get my way and he won't answer me and so I'm going to just walk away, right? A couple rejections or silence from God and we're done. Faith that is alive not only believes that Jesus can bless you, but that he will bless you. It's not just a, I know Jesus can do it, He's done it for some other people, but he won't do it for me. And so here comes this misword, misspelled word. Her faith kicked in because she 
It's supposed to be understood the world that these two creatures exist in. Now, I'm about to show you two creatures. That there is Thomas. Thomas the cat. Now, I know you're saying, Pastor, we're talking about dogs. Just stay with me. And that there is Pretty Girl. So we've got Thomas and Pretty Girl, correct? Now, follow this text with me. She says, yet even the dog under the table eats the crumbs. What you need to know about Thomas and Pretty Girl was they were the cats of Sugar's Aunt Janetta. Now, I contend to this day, Aunt Janetta was independently wealthy. We don't really discuss it as a family. And here's how I arrive at this conclusion. Thomas and Pretty Girl ate turkey that was $8 a pound. <laughs> Hello? Is somebody there already? She understood a Thomas and Pretty Girl mentality. That if Aunt Janetta will bless you with some turkey at $8 a pound, imagine what Jesus is fitting to do for me in my situation as a crumb snatcher. Am I helping you this morning? Thomas and Pretty Girl ate very well. And this woman stood between Jesus, understanding some very serious realities. Sure, 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 your children were disrespectful. They didn't do what you told them to do, but I'm here, and I need some help. And word has it on the street, Jesus, that you've been healing people, and I need a little breakthrough. So guess what faith alive requires? It requires persistence and humility. She understood that I'm not going to just walk away from Jesus because he said something I didn't really want to hear. If Jesus is the healer and I need a healing, well, maybe I need to change to get what he's asking me to understand. I can't keep coming at him with my prideful self. I might be a dog, I might be a whole lot of things. You called me worse. Just don't call me late for dinner if I'm Thomas and Pretty Girl, right? Don't call me late for the blessing. You can call me whatever you want, but Jesus, I recognize who you are and I want some of that. And my faith is not going to allow me, ready, to go back to a dying situation without a healing from you. Maybe y'all don't need no Jesus this morning. Watch this. Faith that is alive requires that you must go to Jesus. How many of us are in some situations that need some healing, and we keep singing, come by here? <laughs> love the song dearly. Maybe you need to get up and go there. <laughs> if Jesus is anywhere around, go to where Jesus is and lay your situation at the feet of Jesus and say, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Here's the kicker. Faith that is alive believes that Jesus can heal from a distance. You keep opening the door waiting for Jesus to walk right up in your situation. Or we feel so disconnected because I can't see Jesus and he's not here and I don't hear his voice. Are you persistent? Are you humble? Are you willing to take it to him? Or does he always have to selfishly come see about you? You ready? We said, based on James chapter 2, faith without works is dead. The work this woman did was she got up from her situation, walked herself to Jesus. If this is the faith of an outsider, how about us? How about us? Are we dead or alive? She, biblically, had absolutely no reason to be in front of Jesus. We showed you the temple. She didn't even get an opportunity to go close to the most holy of holies. But she knew about Jesus as a healer. And she knew that if anything was going to change, she had to get up and go to where Jesus is. And so we 
have the privilege of having the temple curtain torn, able to walk into the throne room of God, throw ourselves before the mercy seat and say, Father, hear about my situation. Are we willing, as children of God, to get up and go have a healing encounter with Jesus? And so I leave you simply this morning asking you, based on the text, based on your life, how is our faith? How is our faith as a congregation? How is our faith as individuals? How is your faith as a family unit? Is it dead or alive? And are you ready to go to work? In Jesus' name, amen.